Hi, I'm Miss Bovey. And I'm Miss Hardy. And today's topic of our podcast is the Latin American revolutions. So the era between 1770 and 1828 marked an era of revolutions throughout the world. In our last podcast, we talked about the American and the French revolutions. And today we're going to be looking at the Haitian and the South American revolutions. And really, the point that we want to make is how much Enlightenment thought um, encouraged sort of this rise to petition against the government. The American Revolution sort of is causes the inspiration for the subsequent revolutions. Um, now, the biggest events, if we're putting things in context, will be the rise of Napoleon in Europe that will directly influence what happens in South America and in Haiti. And now we're going to turn to look at the Haitian Revolution first. So, Ms. Hardy, what happened during the Haitian Revolution? So, the Haitian Revolution occurs from the year 1791 to 1804. So, let's go back a little bit and talk about the colony of Saint Domingue. So, it's by far France's richest overseas possession. So, it occupied this western half of the island of Hispaniola, and it accounted for a third of France's foreign trade. So in that, they have half a million African slaves that had to work on their plantation system under horrendous conditions, so harsh that they had to consistently bring in more slaves to make up for those um, who had died from the harsh uh, plantation lifestyle. What type of plantations are we talking about? So in uh, South America, Latin America, and we're really focusing on sugar plantations. Those are the big ones in Brazil and in Haiti. And then in North America, we have a lot of cotton plantations. Thank you. No problem. So after the reverberations of the French Revolution reach Saint Domingue, there's a revolution in Haiti um, that moves through several stages that are that are kind of contradictory uh, in their nature. So at first, the main conflict was between the whites who dominated the plantation economy and the gens de couleur, these free men and women of mixed race who were about equal with the whites in number. So a lot of artisans and small farmers and some of the gens de couleur were even prosperous enough to own a few slaves themselves. A lot of them were literate uh, and they had followed these events of the American and French revolutions and they themselves demanded liberty and equality. And so by 1791, we have a civil war that breaks out between the planters and these gens de couleur. So none of the groups wanted to end slavery. Uh, however, the Civil War created a vast slave uprising organized by a voodoo priest named Bookman, and he's named Bookman because he was literate, so he's the book man. Uh, and so with this, the voodoo beliefs and rituals that came from West and Central Africa and that syncretic belief system, um, as their religious leader, Bookman had a lot of authority among the African slaves. And his position as his master's coach driver, uh, coach driver, sorry, gave him the mobility to organize thousands of slaves to uprise um, basically at his signal. So when they did so in the summer of 19, or 1791, the rebels were spontaneously joined by tens of thousands of other slaves across the island, as well as by Maroons, these runaway slaves who lived in the mountains. So just as the French peasants had burned the manor houses of their aristocratic overlords, now Bookman's slave army attacked the planters' estates in Saint Domingue. 40,000 of them marched on the city of Le Cap, where a lot of whites and gens de color had taken refuge. So the slaughter lasted for weeks until the planter forces finally captured and executed Bookman. They fixed his head on a pole just like the French did with their pikes. And they hung a sign around his neck that said, this is that, well, what was his neck? This is the head of Bookman, the chief of the rebels. Just wow. kill them and execute them, just like the French Revolution. We had those same uh, types of events happening. So in 1792, just one year later, the French government sends an army to Torstal Order. They're like, look, this has gone far enough. This is mayhem. Too many people are dying. You might have killed the head of the rebel force, but we still need to send an army to calm things down. And because one third of their economy comes from the plantations in Haiti, it is in their like dire interest to make sure that they stabilize what is happening in this region. Right. The slaves right now are very... Um, successful in their revolt thus far. And if they win, they no longer have um, that plantation economy that makes up that third of their trade revenue. So just as they come over to bring the French army to kind of settle it down, there's a new commander uh, that emerges over the slave revolt. His name is Toussaint Louverture. 
He was born a slave, but um, as he worked in his master's house, um, he ends up going on to become educated in Europe with these Enlightenment thoughts. So he comes back, uh, and similar to another um, person that we see, Olado Equiano, he has this diverse experience that allows him to bridge the world of slave and master. So though he was a slave, he um, was a freed man, he had been educated, he's able to bridge both worlds. So he can organize the slaves to fight while also forging alliances with the whites, the Jean de Colour, and a lot of the foreign forces that had intervened. And by 1801, his army controlled most of the island. And so he supported this idea of a new constitution that granted equality to all and also declared to St. Louverture governor for life. Yeah, so a nice position. <laughs> nice position to have. So initially, a lot of uh, some of the radical French revolutionaries supported the rebels uh, with their um, Enlightenment ideals. But Napoleon did not. And in 1802, he sends an expedition to crush Toussaint Louverture's army. Uh, and so he was open, Toussaint was open to compromise as long as slavery would not be restored. And he freely agreed to meet with the French officers to discuss the matter. However, they betrayed them. What a surprise. And instead, sent him to France uh, to be in prison where Toussaint Louverture will die in prison from these French uh, government people from Napoleon coming to chat about what they should do with the newly um, kind of resolved Haitian slave army. So while Toussaint Louverture is imprisoned and dies in France, uh, many of the soldiers sent by Napoleon to Haiti, lacking the immunity to tropical diseases, died from malaria and yellow fever. And so in Haiti, the mosquitoes had more firepower that drove away the French <laughs> than than the actual military themselves. It was the disease that killed them. It's amazing. Similar to how the frostbite and the freezing weather conditions in Russia killed more men of Napoleon's in Russia than did actual military. So Napoleon has two armies on two separate hemispheres that both die from more from natural causes uh, in the sense of cold versus uh, mosquito diseases That's kind than of crazy. from actual fighting. I know. And so um, the subsequent independence of Haiti did terrify a lot of slave owners in the United States. So some plantations stepped up security measures, uh, and the U.S. government refused to grant Haiti a diplomatic recognition. They refused to recognize them as an independent nation. Because they were terrified that if Haiti is recognized on the international stage as an independent country, then the slaves that they themselves own might take that same sort of desire and rise up against the government. Yep. Absolutely. And so in 1795, a Venezuelan man who had returned from Haiti, um, a free uh, Zombo, which is known as like a mixed african American indian ancestry, he's going to lead a rebellion of slaves and free persons of color, sending the elite of the Caracas into a huge panic. So this reverberates far from Haiti. It's now moved into Venezuela. And Simone Bolivar was just 12 at this time, uh, and he's going to later to seek to support the Haitian government. And he's going to argue for the abolition of slavery in South America as well. So it's important to note that um, Haiti will become the first country in Latin America to win its independence. And the first successful slave revolt in history. Yeah, and the fact that it's led by the black population is also a significant. So let's do a quick comparison between the Haitian and the French revolutions. Both will grow out of the Enlightenment's insistence that men had natural rights as citizens and that legal constraints were limiting the freedom of people by forcing them into various estates. However, in the case of the Haitians, the restraints were more severe in that the rebellion was led by slaves who had no rights at all. Now, long after its revolution, poverty would continue to plague Haiti, while in France, protection of property and the reform of taxation enacted during the French Revolution would help France's economy recover. But the outcome in both cases was increased freedom for their citizens. In France, the legal establishment of estates was abolished along with the last vestiges of feudalism, and in Haiti, slavery was abolished and the rights of citizens were upheld. While class differences did not evaporate, legal discrimination was ended in Haiti even before its independence by a constitution in 1801. Mm. So, now let's sort of change tides and see what happens in the rest of South America. So we've seen how class distinctions in Haiti has led to revolt, but Ms. Bogey, my question to you is, how do we see class distinctions cause a revolution in Latin America? 
Well, most of you should be familiar with the idea that once Spain starts to colonize South America, because they colonize with men, uh, what will happen it will be a divide with social classes based on racial identity, because the men will take to wife women, indigenous women, slave women, etc. And so you have a, a growing mixture of people in South America, unlike what happens in the American colonies or even with the French that come in. It's a little bit different. Um, so what happens is you have at the very top of ruling society through Spanish colonial America are the peninsulares. These are Spanish-born whites, essentially. And then the next highest level of people will be the Creoles. And the Creoles were Spaniards born in the Americas. That's the only distinction, the distinction is that they were not born in Spain. They were born on, in one of the American colonies. And because of that distinction, peninsulares got all of the best government jobs. They, ha they held the highest positions, um, royal commissions for the most part, where the Creoles had a lot of the wealth. They owned mines, they operated businesses, they were landowners, but they could not hold the high significant government positions. Now, Ms. Hardy talked about the fact that when Napoleon rises in power in our last podcast, he puts his relatives on the thrones of other countries to help sort of stabilize his growing kingdom, and one of those countries will be Spain. And so they force out the previous king of Spain, and this is when the Creoles recognize the need to seize an opportunity for political advancement. And this is what will kick off the rise of South American revolutions because the king will actually ask the Creoles to form military armies in case Napoleon changes his aims to sort of come over to the Americas. And when they get control of these militaries known as juntas, they will use them as their military body to actually lead the revolutions. So let's look at Mexico first. The Mexican Revolution really begins with Father Miguel Hidalgo, who called on Indians and mestizos for support in his 1810 drive for Mexican independence. Hidalgo and his followers won several early battles, but the previously symp sympathetic Creoles turned on him when the revolutionaries began attacking and looting their property. Now, as the owners of large ranches and mines, the Creoles eventually supported the Spanish authorities who came to represent law and order, and the Spanish captured and executed Hidalgo. Well, interestingly enough, a major Creole colonel by the name of Augustin Iturbid, is that how you say it, Miss Hardy? I think it's either be they. Something like that. I actually think that's real. That's it. You're probably right. 1821, Iturbide. Thank you. <laughs> I have you with Spanish. You help me with French. <laughs> attracted the support of the Mexican army and the Roman Catholic Church and essentially seizes the power that Father Hidalgo had initially established. So the fact that he goes from being a Spanish supporter against Hidalgo and then recognizes once Hidalgo's dead that he can seize power. And what does he appoint himself as? An absolute monarch, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, he creates his own little empire with himself as emperor. Um, he doesn't keep that very long. Opposition forces will eventually, like, take him down, and he will be succeeded by General Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana. The same um, Santa Ana, a famed Texas history with the Alamo? Absolutely. Same guy. And it's under Santa Ana that Mexico will become a republic. Now, one of the things that you're going to notice as we continue to study sort of the evolving Mexican history, and really that of South America, is that they will go through many different types of military dictatorships and governments all the time because, because with the Creole elites and the creation of these junta, these military organizations, that whenever someone is unhappy with how whatever political direction whatever South American country is going, then another junta will rise up and sort of seize power or there will be a coup or something like that. So you're going to see lots of political unrest. This is just the start of it from their independence from Spain, but it will continue until even present day there's continued unrest and because of the juntas in whatever you just name it, South American country. So the two biggest ideas to take from the Mexican Revolution is that in 1824 they created a constitution which guaranteed basic civil rights. Um, an ongoing issue in Mexico is the redistribution of land because the peasants want access to land and land ownership. And of course it's still going to be held mostly in the hands of wealthy owners, landowners anyways. Um, 
And then also the fact that they wanted to limit the role of the Roman Catholic Church in politics and government and education. And as you know, later on in the mid-1820s, between 1820 and 1850, there'll be ongoing conflicts with the United States, which will come to a head in the Mexican-American War um, in 1846. So, Ms. Hardy, now that we've sort of seen what's happening in Mexico during this time period, what's happening in South America? So in South America, we have a desire from, uh, for independence from Spain, and it's growing among this Creole class. And so fearing the masses, the Creoles refused to support um, any of the mestizos, Indian, and mulatto peoples. And so the Creoles were now seen, um, they had seen this result of the slave uprising in Haiti, as well as the excesses of the French Revolution during that reign of terror. And so some Creoles, like Simon Bolivar, will continue to push for these Enlightenment ideals in Latin America. They never accepted a crown, uh, or he never accepted a crown, but he was really instrumental in gaining independence from Venezuela, Colombia, Ecuador, and Peru. So Bolivar himself was born in Venezuela uh, in 1783 to a family whose ancestors had been village aristocrats in Spain. Uh, so the family had grown really wealthy um, in, in Venezuela, and Bolivar had a lot of access to this wealth for his revolutionary causes. So after considerable military successes in Latin America fighting the Spanish, his forces achieved really the formation of a large area that he called Gran Colombia. So he hoped it would become a federation, kind of similar to how the United States created their own federation of states, and he wanted one that was based on this Enlightenment ideals. So he described himself as a liberal who believed in a free market and the abolition of slavery, and he even wrote these goals and concerns for Latin America in his Jamaica letter written in 1815. This is a very important letter for you AP World History students, um, so you need to go through and read that and understand the purpose and the effects of it. So in it, he writes that generous souls always interest themselves in the fate of a people who strive to recover the rights to which the creator and nature have entitled them. And one must be wedded to error and passion, not to harbor this noble sentiment. I also love his quote, those who have served the revolution have plowed the sea. I love it. <laughs> He's very eloquent in his writings. So Bolivar will serve as president of Gran Colombia from 1819 to 1830. He had a large area in northern South America, um, and it was made up of present-day Colombia, Venezuela, Ecuador, northern Peru, um, western Guyana, and northwest Brazil. And so due to its size and pressure from a lot of separatists, Gran Colombia will split into three different countries, Colombia, Venezuela, and Ecuador in 1830. So while Bolivar is doing this, Jose de San Martin is another Creole in South America who defeated a lot of royalists to establish his own independent government. So he led troops from his native Argentina over the Andes Mountains and set up independent republics in Chile and Bolivia. So San Martin played this role of liberator in the southern part of South America, much as Bolivar did in the northern part of South America. So Jose de San Martin is hailed as this liberator of Argentina and the protector of Peru. And so Argentina achieved its independence in 1816 and Peru did in 1821, even though the consolidation of Peru's territories wasn't achieved until three years later. So by 1825, most of Spanish America was independent. They're all new republics. They had all been born of the Enlightenment in 19th century liberalism. Cuba and Puerto Rico, though, stayed under Spanish rule until later in 1898. So the new nations of Latin America, they suffered from a long war of independence. Armies loyal to their generals led to the rise of the Cadillos, who uh, only controlled large areas. So these men intervened in national politics to make or break governments, similar to the Juntas. Uh, and so sometimes the Cadillos will defend the interest of the regional elites, and sometimes uh, they'll support the indigenous population and the peasants. But in general, they disregarded representative forms of government and the rule of law. So, Ms. Bovey, we've talked a lot about the unrest created um, by these Creole revolutions in Mexico and in South America. But I don't think this story really works for Brazil. How was Brazil different and unique from these other Bolivar and Mexican revolutions that we've looked at. So when Napoleon invades and takes over Spain, of course he then moves into Portugal. And instead of staying behind in the country and trying to like get rid of the imposing threat from Napoleon, 
the king of Portugal actually flees to his colony in Brazil and instead just sort of moves the capital there. This takes place in 1807. Now, by 1821, Napoleon is no longer in um, Europe and has been deposed and is living in St. Helena. In fact, I'm not sure if he's already dead by that point. But um, our king of Portugal will return home and becomes King John VI. He takes that name as a constitutional monarch because they do change the type of government they have. But his son, Dom Pedro, stays in Brazil as his regent. Now, when the Portuguese government decides to threaten Brazil's political autonomy, many Brazilians start to, like, rise up with this threat of revolution. And in a surprising twist, Dom Pedro decides to side with the Brazilians and uh, declares Brazil's independence from Portugal in 1822, one of the most nonviolent battles for independence in all of Latin America. So essentially, he just writes his dad and says, uh, Dad, I'm just going to be the new leader of a new country, and uh, that's it. You've always wanted this for me. I'm just living out my potential. Exactly. So he's declared Emperor Pedro I and establishes a constitutional monarchy in Brazil. And Brazil remains a monarchy with the same social system in place until 1889, when it too will become a republic after a, conservatory, a conservative coup by the military and the upper classes. So it'll be one of the most stable governments actually in South America during the 19th century. So now that we sort of looked at what happened in Latin America during the revolutions, let's look at what the results of those revolutions will be. So even though we do have these enlightened revolutions, not a whole lot is happening socially. We do have the abolition of slavery and we have the blurring of some social distinction lines, but the governments are mostly run by these conservative Creole elites. Uh, and that's really not going to change much during this time period. And this is where the Latin American revolutions really set themselves apart from the French, the Haitian, and even the American revolutions in the fact that these were not rise-ups of ordinary people wanting to grab their power back from the government and really change everything. This was from an already elite group wanting more power than they already had over everyone else. And so it makes things a little bit different. That's why you're not going to see the radical shifts of how society functions because we already have an elite group now just having more power than they had before. Which is why there's no surprise that women don't even gain a lot from this revolution. Even though it's based in some places in the Enlightenment, we're not going to see a big introduction of women into the political force like we will see with the rise of feminism as a result of our American and French revolutions. Uh, instead, they're going to stay pretty much a status quo. Yeah receiving very little education, and won't make much political impact during the 19th century. Well, we appreciate you listening to our podcast over our Latin American revolutions, and we will see you next time. See ya.